I started gaming in the PS1 days, not long after Sega decided to cannibalize itself out of the console market with two competing 32-bit hardware SKUs, and I was not blessed with older gamer siblings or techie parents, so outside of a Genesis setup at the dentist's office, I wasn't really exposed to Sonic the Hedgehog, gaming icon, until he went third party. I knew about him, of course, it was literally impossible not to as a millennial child with a television, but to me, Sonic was just a character in cartoons, coloring books, and surprisingly great Archie comics until Sonic Adventure 2 Battle came along. I loved that game and Adventure DX not long after it, but I probably don't have to tell you how those have aged or what quality of games would follow them, and somewhere between the hedgehog human makeout sesh and unleashing of the werehog, I moved on from Sonic for my own sanity. That took seven years, though. Almost half my life at that point in my life spent liking, or very badly wanting to like, a video game franchise without a single good new video game in it, at least not on home consoles. And that speaks to the raw power that Sonic possesses as an idea, as an aesthetic. I'm hardly the only one who's felt it. Sonic's huge, hardcore fan following combines the chuny enthusiasm and overt horniness of shonen anime stands with the deep-rooted nostalgic obsession and repressed horniness of Disney people. It's horrifying, but also remarkable. I can't think of any other series this uneven and mismanaged that's managed to inspire such long-term devotion or such a massive volume of fan art, fan fiction, fan games, original characters, and... It's not just the marketing blitz behind the series that got us here. If it were, we'd be seeing existentially nightmarish Super Eye Patch Wolf videos about the Animorphs fandom. No, on a truly primal level, something about Sonic resonates with people. Kids, especially. And the other night, while listening to my good friend Dan Floyd's efforts to validate the half year of his life that was spent staring at dumb running Sonics, I had an epiphany as to what that something is. And more importantly, how the inspired genius of Sonic's character design has directly resulted in the fandom we know and fear today. But before we get into that, if you're old enough to be nostalgic clicking on Sonic the Hedgehog video essays, you're probably old enough to start thinking about the future of your hairline. Today's sponsor, Keeps, can help with that. Hair loss, like Sonic the Hedgehog pornography, is an unavoidable part of life for a lot of folks. Two out of three people designated male at birth will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35, which, unless you're a full-time Dr. Eggman cosplayer, is not ideal. There's no getting that back when it's gone, but with modern science, you can stop the robotnicization of your scalp before it even begins. And thanks to Keeps revolutionizing the way hair loss is treated, you don't have to go broke to avoid going bald. When you sign up for their service, they'll connect you with a doctor to build a prevention plan around your needs and set you up with the prescriptions you need to implement it. Keeps will then reliably and discreetly ship generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products straight to your door every three months, saving you money and time in the pharmacy line. And time is of the essence here. Prevention is key when it comes to hair loss, and it can take four to six months for these treatments to show results, so the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. And I've got a deal to help you get started. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash basement or click the link in the doobly-doo for 50% off your first order today. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash B-A-S-E-M-N-T. Now back to the science you nostalgia clicked for. To properly understand the genius of Sonic's character design, one must first have a firm grasp on the aesthetic evolution of anime and its roots in the golden age of American animation, specifically what Walt Disney was doing with both comedic short films and feature-length narratives like Snow White. Luckily, the last one's pretty self-explanatory. Even today, it's not hard to see how the face shapes of proto-Disney princesses shaped the faces of early human anime characters, or how in recent years there's been something of a feedback loop between the Disney princess marketing line and anime's moe movement. As for how the simpler, cartoonier end of the Disney house style fits into the bigger picture of anime, I could spend 
thousands of words detailing the evolution of Osamu Tezuka's art and that of the artists inspired by him, with a lengthy aside about Lilo and Stitch's surprising and enduring success in Japan and a bunch of other stuff, or I could show you this one picture of Mickey Mouse, Astro Boy, and Goku that sums it all up perfectly. Goku is modern anime's Mickey Mouse, and as was the case with Mickey Mouse, Goku's creator, and later the massive corporation that owns and endlessly exploits his IP, would go on to surround that illustrated icon with dozens upon dozens of complementary character designs. While many of those characters are now icons in their own right, fashion icons even, the most iconic and enduring of all is, of course, Vegeta, who set the standard for the shonen rival as a cooler, snarkier, edgily darkier counterpart to the excitable doofus hero with even spikier, more aerodynamic hair. A template that has proven with time to be just as viable as a hero by itself if you sand down the edges a bit, and has thus been iterated upon by shonen artists inspired by Toriyama almost as much as Goku himself. And the true genius of Sonic the Hedgehog is that he represents essentially a re-Mickey Mouseification of the Vegeta template, a slicker, faster, cooler, bluer, more 90s optimized iteration, every bit as iconic, powerful, and potentially merchandisable as the genuine article. So why would one even want to make Vegeta a Mickey Mouse? loads of reasons. For what Sega was attempting, the impromptu Central Park survey group that helped Naoto Oshimoto settle on this Mr. Needlemouse design could not have picked a more perfect candidate. Mario is video games Mickey Mouse, and as villains go, he's mostly just got a bunch of big, fat, uncool Pete the Cats. So the field was wide open for a cooler, more iconic Mario rival to enter the picture. And a company looking to compete with the biggest name in gaming couldn't ask for a better anti-Mario mascot than Vegeta Mickey Mouse. Sonic had a face you could slap on anything you wanted to sell, a face you remembered after seeing it just once, and most importantly, a face that possessed those qualities while standing apart from every other monolithic pop cultural entity that already possessed them, allowing his image to endure in popular culture basically no matter how badly Sega screwed his games and supplementary media up, which was, at many points, about as badly as they conceivably could have. The design also, of course, lends itself handily to both slick sprite animations and syndicated Saturday morning cartooning. So well that Sonic had two cartoons on air simultaneously in 1993, one with an anarchic Looney Tunes vibe, the other, which would form the basis for those great Archie comics I mentioned earlier, following in the footsteps of the era's action cartoons with a dark story of woodland freedom fighters opposing industrial oppression, not entirely complemented by a chunky art style a lot closer to DuckTales than, say, Gargoyles. Sonic has never tried to hide his anime roots. I mean, those blue roots turned glowing gold for the first time in Sonic 2, just one year after the Super Saiyan concept was first introduced in DBZ. However, throughout his 16 and 32-bit Super Sonic run, his cartoon influences simply shone a lot brighter. Sonic was aiming to capture the American market, after all, and American kids simply didn't like anime. Until, all of a sudden in the mid to late 90s, they did a whole lot. Sonic the Hedgehog, fastest trend chaser alive, was not far behind, launching a striking new animated up art style inside a striking new 3D platformer alongside a striking new game console with Sonic Adventure for the Sega Dreamcast on December 23rd, 1998. And with that slight shift in design priorities, plus a slate of small but smart style tweaks in 2001's Sonic Adventure 2, the franchise's fan-fueled undeath was eternally guaranteed. You see, Mickey Mouse's, originally Oswald the Lucky Rabbit's, are precision engineered to be as visually appealing and versatile in motion as possible while still being incredibly easy to draw. Noodly limbs with big, chunky hands and feet to accentuate movement, stuck on a cute little bean body with bright shorts to help define the midsection through contrast, and topped with a big, pale, massive-eyed mono face that helps to define the head in the same way while allowing for a wide range of expression. And of course, the 
head behind that face is itself defined by a few simple, iconic shapes. The addition of color and innovation of cartoon glove hands has complicated these design principles over the years, but only slightly. The fundamentals remain the same. If you can draw three overlapping black circles of roughly the right size and spacing, you too can make a recognizable Mickey Mouse. Slap three quarter circles on the side of a bigger circle and you got a Sonic the Hedgehog, and the body underneath isn't that much harder to replicate. All of this is exactly what you want in a character who needs to be drawn and redrawn by a factory floor full of artists about 700 times per minute he's on screen. It also, conveniently, means the character is incredibly easy for even the most untalented aspiring artist or just fan to reproduce and iterate upon in the margins of their notebooks, their own sketch pad, whatever paper's handy, really. If you can get fans making do and art of your characters, they will develop a much deeper attachment to them than they would from simply buying merch or consuming content. Sanrio, the Pokemon company, and of course Disney itself have all leveraged this principle to unfathomable profit over the years. Sonic, too, got a lot of mileage out of it. He graced the face of a lot of Trapper Keepers. But despite being the cool cartoon mascot, classic Sonic was still fundamentally cute, goofy, and cartoony, not necessarily emulatable in his coolness. You want to collect and look at Pikachus, Hello Kitties, and Mickey Mouses, not be them. Anime, conversely, is very good at creating cool scenarios that we want to project ourselves into, power systems that encourage us to imagine our own unique abilities, physical actions that are fun to mime out. If you've ever done a Naruto run or practiced your Kamehameha, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That said, the coolness of a Vegeta is a lot harder to faithfully reproduce on paper than the cuteness of a Mickey Mouse. I myself am a writer today primarily because I could never get my stupid spindly fingers and shaky inflexible wrist to accurately reproduce Yugi Moto's hair spikes. Sonic's redesigned art style with its longer noodles, shinier eyes, and spikier spikes, despite being, as Dan explained in exhausting detail, kinda crap for 3D animation, manages to capture the coolness of anime without sacrificing the artistic accessibility of Sonic's Mickey Mouse origins. So long as you're decently confident with drawing basic shapes, you can get like 90% of the way to an authentic feeling Sonic Adventure 2 promo illustration with a little bit of effort, maybe struggling a bit with the shading and shoes. And even if you just trace, it's not hard to grasp the essentials and make alterations to a character that feels stylistically cohesive, which was game changing. For you see, by reverse engineering Vegeta back into a Mickey Mouse, Naoto Oshima inadvertently cracked the code for converting any anime archetype into a marketable looking cartoon mascot. Be they a Rock Lee Mickey Mouse, a Sakura Mickey Mouse, or a Naruto Mickey Mouse. Seriously, Orange Fox, Multiple Tails, Violent Pink Girl only likes his cooler, bluer, spikier friend. I'm on to you, Kishimoto. You and your original characters. But we needn't limit ourselves to popular shonen designs. These conversion metrics work just as well with a Grandia Fina Mickey Mouse or Darkstalker's Morrigan Mickey Mouse. Hell, Shadow the Hedgehog is a double Vegeta Mickey Mouse, a concept a little too excessive to work in actual anime, but just the right level of too much to be taken way too seriously in this cartoony but cool world. Saying sayonara to him will fill you with sadness. Once you have a setting that can accept something like Shadow the Edgehog, especially one with several aesthetically contradicting lines of continuity born from different comic artists and animation studios putting their own spin dash on the material, the sky is basically the limit for fans to bring their own ideas or sonicified versions of their favorite anime and video games ideas into that world. By the time Sonic Riders arrived with the Babylon Rogues, it was already impossible to distinguish new official characters from high-end fan creations. Eventually, the fans would get better at this than Sonic Team themselves. By taking Sonic's style into the simple and clean end of the Kingdom Hearts zone of the anime cartoon spectrum, Sega took the ingenious design means they'd already created and gave fans a powerful visual motive to generate an endless 
parade of original characters do not steal, embodying their own personalities and their otherwise difficult to draw anime action ideals. Though of course having tapped deeper into the look and feel of anime, or to use the scientific terminology, fuckable cartoons, Sonic Team also opened the floodgates to By now, you should fully understand the singular significance of Sony the Horjhag's character design innovations, but what can we do with that wisdom? A fair bit. For example, it aids us in understanding why, despite Sonic Boom being the funniest, best written, best world designed, and best Amy and Knuckles containing iteration of the series to date, a large portion of Sonic's fanbase rejected it out of hand. Sonic Boom moves these characters out of the Kingdom Hearts zone and into the One Piece zone typically reached by starting with the basic filmic components of anime and cartooning them up, as opposed to trying to make Mickey Mouse's anime cool and designing Disney anime hybrid humans to fit alongside them. This is a very subtle distinction. People have died over it. While Sonic Boom's characters move a lot more naturally in 3D, they're also a lot harder to visually reproduce. You gotta illustrate a lot of different body types. Perspective and proportions matter more in this style. The layering of Sonic's bandages is very specific. If you're making an OC, you can't just take the one body and head type, change the spikes, colors, and fur patterns, and call it a day. You actually have to make the character fit into this outbacky jungle punk world, which even Shadow feels a bit out of place in. This simply isn't the anime animal playground that 2000's Mobius was. Understanding this can help Sonic Team and others working with the brand steer the series direction more confidently moving forward, so we never again see another human teeth and legs Sonic. And on a broader level, having a firm grasp on Sonic's fundamental vegetosity and Mickey Mousiness can help the animators and artists working with him get the most out of his design. For instance, if they had his hair spikes and mono eye cheat to face the camera the way his side mouth already does, and Mickey's ears do in the epic Mickey games, that might help to bring 3D Sonic up to the same level of visual polish as sprite-based Sonic. The theoretical ideal here is a Sonic side-scroller, maybe with some behind-the-back bits, that looks like a 3D Arc System Works game. Tell me you wouldn't play the shit out of that. Most importantly, though, with this breakthrough in hand, if we can also crack the design language of Undertale or Homestuck, we can build a more complete theory of uncontrollably horny fandom evolution, and using that knowledge... Ah... Uh, I'm sure we'll think of something eventually. To be honest, I mostly just made this video as an excuse to say double Vegeta Mickey Mouse out loud. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.